I meant to be on my splash screen again, but I wasn't. But that's cool because everything went well and the I pressed my one button that throws everything into motion and it all worked. It didn't all work last week and I had a really long splash screen, but it don't matter because I'm here and I'm glad to be here. I'm R.K. Brown. This is Bible study. I'm really glad to be with you. Love doing this. Thank the Lord that I can do this. So I'm going to pull my microphone just a little bit closer to me. There we go. Uh, last week, I talked about the fact that I had preached a couple of funerals and that I started out talking to the people and said that we are here for one reason, and that reason is sin. Not the person's sin who's laying over there in the casket, but Adam's sin, because Adam's sin brought death into the world. I talked about that, and I called the lesson because of sin. But tonight, my lesson is going to be because of Christ. Because, yes, Adam brought sin into the world. In fact, the scriptures tell us that for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death. Adam sinned by being disobedient to God and partaking of the fruit of the knowledge of the the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he knew good from evil, he became a sinner. And I showed last week that everything brings forth after its own kind. Like, you know, a cow brings forth a cow, a cat brings forth a cat, a dog brings forth a dog. There might be different breeds. And by the very nature of that word breed tells you that people have have breeded or, you know, n- nature over the years has breeded different types of characteristics until we have all these different kind of dogs but a dog is still a dog and you can pretty much as far as i understand you can pretty much breed any dog with any dog not a great idea but you can breed any cat i think they breed lions and tigers they call them ligers so a cat is a cat a dog is a dog i know they're not all actually breedable but they do breed lions and tigers ligers i'm not sure how they do it i mean obviously they're not copulating but they, they can do it scientifically, you know. So anyway, Adam became a sinner and he could only beget other sinners. And all through history, that's all that's ever been born since Cain and Abel were born was sinners. And here we are, sinners. The wages of sin is death. Death came by sin, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now we're going to go to Romans chapter 5 and read a lot out of that chapter because it pretty much explains it all. Paul says it in so many ways that it's impossible to misunderstand it, I believe. So here we go, Romans 5. And by the way, I think this is going to be a pretty short lesson. It would be shorter if I weren't rambling. Romans 5, verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Now, what he means is when we were yet without strength, it means that we were in our sinful state and couldn't get ourselves out of it. We had to have the blood atonement of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection to take us out of our our weak state, our sinfulness, and into righteousness. Verse 7, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. So, you know, you might not die for just some old, you know, wicked person, but maybe for a righteous person, a good person, somebody that you deem to be good, you might be willing to give your life for. Obviously, certainly you'd give your life, if you're a mother especially, would give your life for your children. I believe most fathers would do that, give their life for their children, give their life for their family. But, verse 8, But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were in a sinful state, at enmity with God. In other words, we 
were enemies of God. The Bible tells us that God is angry with the wicked every day. I remember when I was uh, a younger man, I guess in my 30s, late 30s, I used to watch TBN a lot, the Trinity, Trinity Broadcasting Network, and I would hear from time to time Paul and Jan Crouch or some other preacher some other person speaking, saying, you know, talking to the unbeliever, God is not angry with you. Yes, he is. If you are a non-believer, if you don't believe on Jesus Christ, if you've not put your trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, God is angry with you. God is angry with the wicked every day. And if you're not righteous through the blood of Christ, then you are wicked. God is angry with you. I don't know any other way to say it. It's the truth. Verse 9, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. You see what I'm saying? We shall be saved by, from wrath through him. We are saved by God from God, from God's wrath, because the devil has exacted his influence on the world and on humanity and caused Adam and Eve to sin, and Adam gets the blame for it, caused Adam and Eve to sin. Adam brought sin into the world, and God is angry with the wicked every day. But when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, when we trust Him that the work that Jesus did on the cross by dying for our sins, that He was buried and that God raised Him from the dead, we are saved to God from the wrath of God. To God from God, from His wrath. I hope that makes sense. Verse... 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So you see that we were enemies. Those of us who believe are not enemy, enemies with God anymore. But we were in our sinful state, our weak, unrighteous sta state, we were enemies with God. And if you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, you are an enemy to God and he will exact his wrath on you. He did not send his son Jesus Christ to die on a cross and be buried, be in hell. His soul was in hell. His body was in the grave, but his soul was in hell. You'll see that in Acts chapter 2. But God didn't leave him in hell. He raised him from the dead, guaranteeing that if we put our trust in him, that he will raise us from the dead. Now listen to me real carefully. I'm not saying that you should turn over a new leaf and start living right, as I've heard people say. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe what he did for you. He will change you and cause you to have a desire to live right. Or at very least, he'll cause you to struggle over your sin. For somebody to tell you, Start living right and you'll be saved. That is not correct. That is wrong. That is works. And Romans chapter 7 tells us, But to him that, that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, to him it is counted for righteousness. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, to him it is counted for righteousness. So I'm not saying to you start living right. I'm telling you to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you believe to the saving of your soul, if you really put your trust in what Jesus did on the cross for you, then you'll receive the Holy Ghost. You'll be a new person. You'll be a new individual. And God will begin to work in you to work righteousness. But you cannot save yourself by starting to live right. That is wrong, wrong, wrong. Wrong, and those that teach it, teach it wrong, wrong, wrong. Verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. The blood atonement. And by the way, I meant to mention that he talked about the blood here in a, in a verse or two back. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Hold on. By, okay, yeah, verse 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. 
Anytime the blood of Christ comes up, I like to point out that John MacArthur, that preacher out in California, it's kind of a Calvinist, said in the 70s that it wasn't the blood of Christ that saved us, but the death of Christ. It wasn't important that Christ shed his blood, but it was important. The Bible says in Hebrews, what is it, chapter maybe chapter 2, that without the shedding of blood is no remission. Without the shedding of blood is no remission. And then I watched a video of John MacArthur much, much closer to our time, you know, maybe just a few years ago, trying to defend his position. Well, he was saying that he didn't say that, and then he turned around and doubled down on it. It is by the blood of Christ that we are saved. If Christ didn't shed his blood, if he were somehow suffocated by a pillow, or if he drowned and didn't shed blood, his death would have not served us. If Jesus would have died of a heart attack for our sins, I know it's ridiculous, but I'm just saying, he had to shed blood. John MacArthur, he had to shed blood. That guy is a wicked man. And a lot of people watch him, people I know watch him, and that man is a wicked man. Moving on. All right. Sorry, I'm so... Well, I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry I'm so animated tonight. I'm passionate about Jesus Christ. I love Jesus Christ. He has forgiven me of my sins, which are many, and saved my soul. And He'll do the same for you if you're not saved already. If you're watching this, there's a good chance that you are saved. I understand that because this Bible study, by nature, is for those who are saved. But if you're, you know, because it's kind of deep. But if you are not saved and you happen to be watching this, He will save you. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 8 and 9, that if thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, thou being singular, it means you individual. If thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If you confess with your mouth, if you believe that God raised him from the dead and you confess with your mouth that he'll save you, if you call on the name, you know, the Bible says for, you know, uh, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto... Well, with the heart man believeth unto salvation, and, and with the mouth confession is made unto righteousness. Or however he says it. I can't remember exactly how he says it. For whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So call on him. Just say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I believe what he's saying. I'm a sinner. I believe that you died for my sins. And I believe that God raised you from the dead, which is why I'm talking to you right now, Lord Jesus. I believe it. Have mercy on me, a sinner. There was a parable in, in Luke. I, I want to say Luke chapter 11, where a Pharisee and a publican, a publican was a tax collector, went into the temple to pray. And the publican said something to the effect of, Lord, I thank you that I'm not, or I'm sorry, the Pharisee, who was a religious person of the time, a religious Jew, said, Father, I thank thee. Thee, again, is a singular word. You, when you see the word like you, ye, yours, in the Bible, in the King James Bible, it always means a group of people. When you see thee, thou, thine, it always means an individual. So he's praying to the Lord. He's saying, I thank thee, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that I'm not like, or he said, I thank you, Father, that I'm not like other men. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not an adulterer. I fast twice a week. I tithe on everything that I have. That guy looks good on paper. You know, he does. But the publican, the tax collector, went into the temple and he wouldn't even so much as lift his head up to heaven, but he smote upon his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said, which one of those do you think went down to his house justified, knowing that you know what the answer is? It's the guy that said, wouldn't even look up to heaven that said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And so that's what I'm saying to you to say to Jesus, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he will have mercy on you. If you believe the gospel, he will have mercy on you. And you will never lose your salvation. If you get into some sin, he might beat the tar out of you. But you will never lose your salvation. You can be secure that if you really have placed your trust in Jesus Christ, in the death, burial, and resurrection, in the blood atonement of Jesus Christ, in the resurrection, that God will save your soul. Something has popped up on my screen here. Let me, hold on, let me make it go away. 
There it goes. Okay, it's gone away. Sorry about that. <clears throat> anyway, where was I? Let's move on. All right, I'm at verse 12 now. The Apostle Paul says this in so many ways that it's just impossible for it to be misunderstood. <laughs> Listen to just how many ways he says this. It's, it strikes me every time I read it. I'm just like, man, he wants this point to be understood very well. I read this first verse last week, but I'm going to read this whole little diatribe here right now. <clears throat> okay, at verse 12 in Romans 5. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, in that all have sinned. Because like I showed you last week, Adam was a sinner. After he became a sinner, he could only bring forth after his own kind. He could only produce other sinners. And it has been that way ever since. And my children are sinners. My grandchildren are sinners. My, and your, and your children are sinners. Because you are a sinner and you have produced other sinners. That's how it works. <clears throat> and here we go. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. That's the beautiful thing about the New Testament is that we're not under law, but we're under grace. And where the law is removed, there is no sin because the Bible tells us in, in 1 John chapter 3 that sin is the transgression of the law. I think I put that in my lesson last week. But where sin is removed, there is no sin. But death, because we still have a sin nature, because this flesh, flesh and blood, the Bible tells us, I believe in Romans 8, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That might not be Romans 8, but I think it is. Flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the resurrected man, Jesus even, when he, was, when he appeared unto his disciples after his resurrection, he said, uh, Touch me, for I'm not a spirit. For a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone as you see me have. He didn't even have, he didn't have blood anymore because he shed his blood. <clears throat> flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It's a spiritual thing, and then we're resurrected with a new body, and it's flesh and bone. And so even though there was no law before the law was given, people still died because they still had a sin nature because Adam could only bring forth sinners. <clears throat> Verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them which had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. In other words, Mo when he says Moses, he means when the law was given. So <clears throat> even though there was no law between Adam and Moses, death reigned on those who didn't even sin after Adam because Adam was disobedient and ate of the tree of the knowledge of the tree of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Nobody else did that. But they still died because they were sinners, even before the law came and told us what sin was. And that's what the law was for, was to tell us what sin was. The Apostle Paul says, in, in like in Romans chapter 7, is he said, I am carnal, but the law is good. Or how did he say, the, the law is good, but I am carnal. Is that which is good then death unto me? God forbid, I had not known sin, except the law said, thou shalt not covet. Or I had not known lust, except the law said, thou shalt not covet. Right, So we wouldn't know what sin was without the law. The law is good. We're not under the law because we can't keep the law because of the weakness of our flesh, but the law is actually good. The law is the way God would have it. Only we are sinners and can't keep the law. So Jesus Christ kept it for us and died for us in our stead, in our place. <clears throat> All right, verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. In other words, the offense of Adam is exactly the opposite of the free gift of God. Okay, I'll start again. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, and we are even spiritually dead until we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You who were dead in your trespasses and sins, hath he quickened? It says in Ephesians chapter 2. Quickened means made alive. You who were dead in your trespasses and sins, hath he quickened? And if you believe on Jesus Christ, then you're among those people that Paul was talking to when he said that. That he's made you alive through faith in Jesus Christ. All right, one more time. 
But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. In other words, death came through Adam and salvation came through Jesus Christ. How's he going to say it this time? Because he's going to say it again. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. Again, He's making the contrast that Adam sinned and brought death into the world, but the free gift through Jesus Christ's atonement is exactly the opposite of Adam. So again, and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. In other words, we have all offended God. It's a free gift of salvation. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, I told you Paul was going to say this a lot of ways. He's going to make sure that you understand that Adam brought sin into the world and Jesus Christ brought righteousness through his death, burial, and resurrection. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. The gift of righteousness. The gift of righteousness. The free gift of righteousness. Now why am I emphasizing that so much? Because there are people that will tell you that you have to do thus and such to be saved and there's only one thing that you have to do and that is to truly believe. You have to truly put your trust in what Jesus did for you. And like I said earlier, when you do that, you are born again. God will give you the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost will begin to make a change in you. Romans 5.18 Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. You see what I'm saying? He just says that in so many ways that it's impossible for us not to know what he's talking about. Again, verse 18, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience... Many were made sinners. It can't be plainer than this. Verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Do you get that? Could it be more clear than that? Verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Grace reigned through righteousness, and that's the righteousness of Christ. It's not your righteousness, and it's not mine. It's the righteousness of Christ that Eternal life reigns, that we reign with Jesus Christ in eternal life because of His righteousness. And then, if I've got this correct in my... I don't use notes. So if I have this correct, we're going to read out of Isaiah in the Old Testament to see what Jesus did for us. <clears throat> Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us. All. Do you dig what I'm saying? And that's in the Old Testament. And by the way, in the synagogues, from what I understand, they don't allow the reading of Isaiah 53 because it is such a clear presentation of the gospel. You could preach Jesus Christ from Isaiah 53. 
You could preach the gospel to people. In fact, it got preached somebody in Acts chapter 8. If you go to Acts chapter 8 and read about the Ethiopian eunuch, he was reading out of that scripture. And Philip the evangelist comes upon him and sees him riding his chariot and hears him reading out loud. And Philip runs up to him and says, do you know what you're reading? And he says, well, how can I understand? How can I know without some man to explain it to me? Is he talking about himself or some other man? And of course, Philip climbed up in the chariot and explained to him. And the man believed. Philip baptized him right there where there was some water. The man was saved, believing, understanding that scripture. He was reading out of that scripture. And you can preach Jesus from that scripture because it's so clear that the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and God hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. So here's my conclusion, and I've been doing this through this whole lesson. Here's my conclusion. The Apostle Paul said it like this. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. And I'm telling you right now, it's the same for me right now. I'm an ambassador of Christ as though God did beseech you. If you're an unbeliever watching this, through me. God is beseeching you through my words. And here's it: what he's beseeching you. Let me read it again. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus never committed any sin. He was without sin. And yet, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Where did I see that again? <clears throat> in verse Romans chapter 5, verse 8, But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died died for us and contrast that with for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God so when people die it's because of sin and our flesh is sinful and only sinful but we have the inner man living in us which is the spirit of God which is the spirit of Jesus Christ dwelling in us who are born again and that is the person that's saved. Our flesh is not going to be saved. We're going to be given a new resurrected body. Our flesh and our blood is going to go to the ground and disintegrate in the dust. Or, you know, if you're cremated, which you should not be, I don't believe. But if you are, we're going to, you know, it's, you're going to go up in smoke. You're going to be ashes or you're going to be dust. But you're not going to be flesh and blood anymore. But through one man's offense... Sin came into the world, and we die because of sin. But we will live and have everlasting life because of Christ. I hope that makes sense. That's my lesson. Um, I am a member of uh, Fatherland Baptist Church in Madison, Tennessee. Y'all come visit us. Look us up. Come visit us. There's our website, of course. Also, if you're watching by Facebook and or YouTube, then smash the like button. Also, you will find me on uh, Rumble as RK Shade. You will find me on BitChute as Bible Study with RK Brown. And, of course, YouTube as Bible Study with RK Brown. And also on Truth Social. I link my videos to Truth Social, Bible Study with RK Brown. So you will find me in those places. And I hope you got something out of the lesson. Them's powerful words right there. Not my words, but the words of God. And I hope you got something out of it. And if you're a person who didn't believe at the beginning of the message, I hope that you have called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and been saved. Lord willing, you know, I may be out next week. I'm not sure. I don't know yet. So I might see you next week. I might not. We're, I'm going to be on the road again. I've been off for a couple of weeks. And, and uh, so anyway, thank you for watching. Y'all pray for me, and uh, I'll see you next week maybe. All right, good night. God bless you.